We are going to continue some spirited discussion we had right before lunch and just recently about the role of HR. And uh, you all know, full disclosure, I'm in HR. And uh, I'm really ready to have an engaging discussion with all three of my panelists about elevating HR into the future, really in the digital age, focusing on tech talent, focusing on tech. We have a polling question to kick off. So if you can pull out your cell phones and pull up the poll. Our panel is called the Talent Equation. And so in the spirit of an equation, I wanted us to think about the life cycle of the employee experience, starting with attraction all the way through to, dare I say, separation. Where along the employee life cycle, if you could pick one, do you as a CEO put your biggest investment? And that can be time, money, energy. Where is your biggest investment? So we'll give folks a few seconds to weigh in. OK, so big, big chunk around development, also around onboarding, um, not so much at the ends around attraction and separation. Why is that important? Catherine, I'm going to start with you. At the Muse, you really look all at, it's all about um, connecting candidates and employers and really understanding in an authentic way the, uh, the employee experience. What are you seeing around attraction and, and uh, recruitment that we should be thinking about? Well, I think it's a really interesting time because, um, you know, a few years ago there was a lot of ink spilled about how the millennial generation is changing everything about the way that companies recruit. Then, of course, you had leaders like Laszlo Bach at Google who came forward and said, well, millennials are actually just loudly agitating for things that employees of all ages and generations want, like more workplace flexibility, um, better role definition, and, and also paths of growth. And it's been interesting. So we did a survey recently at the Muse. We have um, 75 million people who use the Muse annually to research companies and careers. And uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty next-gen population. So two-thirds of our users are under age 35, 55% are women, uh, about 50% are non-white. And we asked them a few months ago uh, to rank a variety of different factors that influenced how they chose what company they joined. And interestingly, compensation was third. Mm -hmm. So it was beat mm -hmm. by um, both work-life balance and opportunities for growth. Mm -hmm. And we saw in a lot of the other questions that we asked this sort of focus on um, aligning themselves with a career, not just a job. So for example, 89% of our users told us that they would relocate for the right role. And there was also a, a lot of... Um, I just, I think a lot of really interesting focus on this, um, I think the old way of recruiting was companies trying to pretend that they're the, the, everything for everybody. We are the best place to work. We are the most innovative. Um, you know, when I started The Muse, I used to have a slide where I pulled the, um, some of the, the mission statements from the recruiting pages of Intel, Dell, and HP. And they all sounded the same. You know, we are committed to excellence. Mm -hmm. We are team players. But that's not differentiated, right? That doesn't tell anybody why your roles are different. And so I think that both from a candidate perspective and a company perspective, the most successful recruiting is when companies really identify who they are, what they stand for, what's different or unique about the experiences they offer their employees. And then they communicate that and live those values all the way through the cycle. So um, we're also seeing a lot of really interesting data around candidate experience. Mm -hmm. There was um, a survey recently that sort of rocked a lot of people in the HR world that uh, I believe it was 44% of candidates that have a negative experience interviewing with a company will sever their business relationship mm -hmm. with that employer. 44% that have had a negative experience just through the recruiting process. Yes, and you know what? It kind of makes sense, yeah. right? I think that um, you know there's a, there's a lot that we ask candidates to do to put together a resume, sometimes a cover letter, show up and, and some companies don't even respond when it's a no. Um, other companies have this idea that, you know, because you're not a fit for this role, you're not good enough versus I think the best companies these days are realizing maybe it just wasn't a match. Yeah. And so we're also seeing a lot of uh, the best companies and teams think about how do they create a candidate experience that ensures that the people you ultimately end up offering a job to say yes and the people you reject still think positively about your brand and maybe would consider working for you in the future if a better opportunity or a better match opens up. Yes, and in, if, if I recall the Muse research correctly, for every one position that you recruit for, 100 applicants on average come through and then uh, ultimately 99 don't get that mm -hmm. particular job. And so are you saying that whether it's the 99th person or the second person who you call a silver medal candidate, is it equally important to, to um, 
convey your employer brand to them in a, in a similar way? Well, I think that you can use technology to create scalable systems that, um, that uh, I do think you can treat people differently based on how much time they've invested in your process, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so, you know, we work with uh, Johnson & Johnson. They get almost 2 million applications every year. Um, they're not going to necessarily create a highly personalized experience for uh, the, the, you know, 1.9 plus million people that get rejected. But I think you can, um, you can communicate to people in a way that gives them some more information about your values, your brand. Mm -hmm. And if someone has spent more time with you, if they've gone through three or four different rounds of interviewing, I think that's a point where you can um, ideally put a little bit more time and care into rejecting them yes. um, as a way of maintaining that. They're also likely to be a higher quality candidate if they are that silver medalist. Yes. Um, and those people are more likely to be candidates that whether it's you know three months or three years down the line, your HR team is chasing. So how can you leave them in a position so that if you do come back to them, they say yes yeah. enthusiastically? Yeah, it seems obvious for the silver medal candidate, but we, we've spoke before um, earlier that um, around branding, and it struck me the, the statistic around the Walmart um, CEO with Doug McMillan's ownership of social media has changed the game for Walmart to connect, drive, and build morale. And that 60% of candidates look at the CEO's profile. Are they looking at the company's profile as well? We'll get to that in a second. But one thing you also mentioned, Catherine, is that compensation and pay was third. And we found at Bloomberg also in, in our research that pay matters up to a point, and then it does become about opportunities and some of the trust and transparency that we heard earlier. Anil, I want to pivot to you, and we don't have the, the poll up, but suffice it to say, so many of you are looking at development. What does development look like? Well, you know, we have a unique perspective on this. So the company I run has been around almost 20 years. And uh, and then recently, about two years ago, we sort of became a startup again as, as Glitch. And, and what we've been doing is thinking about what are the things we need to question and challenge, right? And we had focused a lot, and, and we're in tech, right? And so recruiting is, Historically, what gets tons of attention in tech. And we're very fortunate. We have a brand. People know that we've built lots of successful products. So that, that we actually over-index on. We do a good job of getting people to consider. And then we thought about the sort of the development piece. And this is where we had historically been pretty weak. right? And part of it is there's so much churn in tech. People are like, hey, you know, I'm going to be here 18 months. I'm going to be here two years. I'm going to get hopped to another job. And we started to think about, you know, we're very fortunate. We have people who have been at the company five, 10 years uh, which is unheard of in tech. And you know, you'd ask them why, and it would be about challenging themselves, developing their skills, all the same answers right? that you sort of usually mm -hmm. hear. And a lot of what we had missed and not gotten right in the past that we sort of started to you know, revisit was around sort of conventional HR. right? And, and you know, especially if you talk to underrepresented folks, you talk to back channels, and this was me and really until I became a CEO again, I'd say, listen, a couple things you tell almost everybody. When you have a problem, HR is not on your side. Their job is to protect the interests of the company, um, document everything. What do you say to everybody at risk? Those same things. If you're a CEO and you don't know that's what your employees are saying, you've missed the boat, right? Mm -hmm. And that is what I tell everybody. And all of a sudden, I was on the other side of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I was the person mm -hmm. I was like, and, and I had to really think deeply about, well, what are we going to change? And we changed a lot. We moved to um, complete salary transparency within the company, uh, documented for every role that we hire for. We moved to, you know, um, what are starting to be basic fundamental benefits, but um, a um, remote-centric culture where you can choose. We have an amazing office here in New York, but you can choose to be remote. We can do that. There's all the workplace flexibility things you'd expect. Um, we added climate leave for people that were disrupted by extreme weather. We did you know, a lot around benefits and then just process. We document how meetings happen. We document, you know, we have little apps and tools for like choosing who's taking the notes in a meeting so it's not always the most you know, marginalized mm. person that's forced to do it. And those work culture things ended up connecting directly into career development, right? Because the people who were thinking about how can I make my team work better in a meeting, how can I help them collaborate better, turns out they're developing management skills, whether they thought of themselves as an individual contributor or not. And so connecting the dots on those things, then we still have a lot of work to do. I mean, we're a small company, but I think about um, how do you have professional development be, did you anticipate the needs of your team as people and think about what makes them happy on a years and decades scale, which we have the luxury of doing. And it turns out that is what the future of development looks like. And it's not the conventional things, because what we found in the sort of conventional HR practice was it was mostly about reducing the risk of the company. And we cared much more deeply about reducing the risk of our people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one thing that strikes me is you've used this app to mm -hmm. reduce bias, mm -hmm. hopefully, intentionally, yeah. with yeah. the intention yeah, of that. So. And one thing we didn't see in the life cycle as it's listed here, which you can Google and get on any academic HR site, is what's underneath, which is culture, innovation, 
diversity and inclusion, all the things we've been talking about this morning. Yvonne, talk about how that shows up in a productive way. Well, I think so. First of all, I just want to echo some of Anil's points in regards to development. And I think that touches on the diversity and inclusion question. Um, we know, for example, in the technology space where a lot of our clients are technology companies, women leave because of lack of transparency and lack of development opportunities. It's a, it's a huge drive of attrition. And so differential access to those things, a lot of times that's where the bias does show mm. up, right? It's like, how do you know, how, how well do you know how to navigate your organization? And how invested are people in you, and how, how, how much access do you have to these resources, like um, learning resources, growth resources, resources that help you get to that promotion? A lot of times, those are what differentiates you know, the experience of one employee from one group and another employee. Um, and so I, you know, I think we see this across the cycle. Bias and culture come into play um, there. And sometimes it can be quite sneaky. You know, um, so one person's experience of a company may not be the same as another person's experience of a company. And it's really important as a leader to really have a pulse on what's going on. Because again, as you said, Anil, those back channels exist. Yeah. And employees talk, and they talk to people who are thinking about joining your company. Um, they, you know, and they talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as, as they talk to each other, one of the things, and we're talking a lot, a lot about tech talent, because um, really every company at this point is a tech company. And yesterday at the kickoff dinner, we heard that the first thing that startups hire for is engineers. So when we look at technology and technical recruiting, we have found at Bloomberg that people want to be recruited by people who speak the technical language. And they also don't want to work for bureaucrats. They want to work for technologists. Does that resonate? Are you seeing that as well? Very much yes. so. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the board of Stack Overflow, which is a community of coders, and they have a big platform for you know recruiting tech talent. And then obviously, I'm you know a person trying to hire technologists. And you know, there's been a big shift. We're never going to win on compensation. Uber mm. is always going to pay more. Facebook is always going to pay more. And what we tell people is like, we're still going to give you a great wage and incredible benefits and all those things. But if you're just trying to maximize your immediate cash earnings, go over there, right? But if you care about the impact you have on the world. If you care about the ethical stance we have as a company, then come on in. And that cl that's so clarifying. And I, I think it's no coincidence we now our team is majority uh, women and non-binary folks, right? Like that shift happened as soon as we sort of put a stake in the ground of what our, what our values are. But you can't win in like a throw money at the problem battle with the richest companies in the history mm -hmm. of the world. And why would you want to? Sure. Catherine? Yeah. Or what, Yvonne? Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, we, we're a small company, too. And a lot of times, we're competing for talent. I mean, we're in Silicon Valley, so we're really <laughs> competing for talent with the big boys. And like, one of the things we just say is that, like, you're going to have a good time here. Like, we're not going to treat you like crap. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, it, it's sad that that's a selling point. And, and, and we pay people, <laughs> you know, we, we pay people well. But that plus the culture yeah. plus the opportunity to develop and grow means that we're actually able to go against those big companies when it comes to talent and sometimes pull, pull, pull great people. Yeah. So let me ask the, the, the audience real quick. And Catherine, I want to get to you. But it's striking me that... We, it was the smallest bar around attraction and sort of small also around recruitment. So just a, a thought for everyone as you're listening to the panel and you'll have a chance to ask questions. Why is that? Because this feels like there is a war for talent that's happening for tech talent. Do you have a comment, Catherine? Yeah, well, I was going to say, first of all, um, I, I completely agree with what both of you said. And I think what's so interesting is... Um, you know, I, we hear this from companies all the time. They'll say, engineers don't want to talk to recruiters, but I also can't afford to deploy an army of engineers mm. to go recruit more engineers. Mm. They're very expensive. I don't have enough of them to build my products to begin with. And mm. so how do you bridge that gap? And one of the things that, that we're seeing be really effective is finding um, a variety of creative ways to scale the stories and lived experiences of your engineers without having to resort entirely to one-to-one -one conversations. So, um, you know, we have a product at The Muse, but other companies do different things. But basically, to tap employee stories at scale and to mm. find who within your organization is proud of or excited to share their career path, to geek out about a project that they've worked on or something they learned as part of a team at your company. And can you, through text, through photo, through video, through other mediums, can you capture that and distribute it so that people can, um, can consume it and can, can see whether that experience resonates? And I think that that can be really helpful because, again, 
any company can say, we're a great place to be yeah. an engineer. But that's, that doesn't mm. mean anything. You know, it's, 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 and I think this is you know, true in what all of us are saying. It's about finding what specifically does, does being a great place to work look like for your engineering team. Um, and this applies to other you know, uh, functions as well. But how do you really make that come to life? And if, it's, um, if you can have your employees sharing their own personal experiences, it is a thousand times more effective and, and, and better received than somebody, you know, way up top saying, I promise we're, you know, mm. we really care about this stuff. Um, because I think most in-demand talent has heard that yeah. a number of times. They've wised up, yeah, please. And I'll, and I'll just say one thing. I mean, I think it's important how we're framing this because yes, there's a war for talent, but there's a war for talent because there's been a failure to retain people, right? Mm. So people mm. are just jumping from company yes. to company and then companies are having to backfill and hire on new people. Even if you're in a growth stage, a lot of times those growth pains are exacerbated by your retention pains as well. And I think that ties into some of the inclusion conversations yeah. that, we, that we're having And here. frankly, I do think retention is such an important part of this conversation because, um, again, I see so many leaders in what we do at The Muse who think so much about how to get people in their businesses and in the mm -hmm. top of the funnel, but don't think about A, keeping them, and B, the role that what you tell them before they join has in whether yeah. you can effectively keep them. Yeah. Like, I can't tell you how many companies want to pretend like they've solved all their problems. What we see in our data is candidates don't think that any workplace is perfect. In fact, yeah. the more you try and prevent, you know, pretend that everything is just solved and shiny, the more they're skeptical. If you can tell people, look, we are not where we want to be on X. We are in process on Y. We are working on this. But there is genuine commitment to moving it forward. Um, some candidates might opt out. But the ones that say yes are more likely to be part of a solution internally and to accept yeah. that things aren't perfect versus when you tell someone that you know, you're know you A plus, you're great, and they come in and find that that's not the case. You can actually create a really massive problem with dissatisfaction that you could have eliminated had you been more straightforward up front. Yeah. And building on the research, you all are doing some innovative things with this. And Anil, you have said that you want your company to be the best thing that's happened to employees. <laughs> what yeah. really cool, innovative, disruptive things are you doing that might <laughs> shock you? There's a lot of, I mean, you want to, I think the one you're, you're probably alluding to is, you know, we've helped people with their resumes when they say they're looking out in the industry, right? You've helped and, people with their resumes when they're looking externally. Yeah, yeah, you know, and um, and part of it is just, like, how do you, how do you mentor people, right? I want people to acquit themselves well. I don't want people to be at our company because they felt like I didn't have anywhere else to go, mm -hmm. right? You know, that, that is not the way it go. And I think one of the things that's, what's interesting is the vast majority of people who come, you know, internally have said, I'm looking around, I, you know, I was talking to this other company, uh, and I'm like, let me see, and I'm, first of all, I go and I'm like, your LinkedIn looks terrible, right? Like, your resume <laughs> looks terrible. Like, let me help you out. You are a talented person. You're not acquitting yourself well. Like, let's have this conversation. And generally, you know, you talk about, you know, why are you looking? And, and there's sort of two big buckets, right? And one is, um, uh, you know, life changes, right? Yeah, you know, some, your partner is moving somewhere else. You, geographically, it's time for me to try a new industry, like all that stuff. And that's like, that life happens, you know, good, you know Godspeed to you. I want you, I want you to do great. And, and actually, in our case, sometimes people come back because we've been around long enough. So like, mm. that's great. The other category is I don't feel like I have a path forward. I can move forward. I have what I want. It's, it's organizational. And then I'm like, my job is to fix those problems. Right? That is my obligation. Mm. And so I'm like, I'm glad we can have this conversation. So it opens the door to those things. And then genuinely to help people, one of the great things that happens a lot is people go out and they look and they're like, every company knows what to say. Every CEO knows the right words to say about inclusion. Every company knows how to market themselves as caring about this stuff. And then they go out and they say, well, they, you know, what Catherine said, they pretended they were perfect. And I went in and I looked around at who looked like me in that organization mm -hmm. and what their roles were. And I thought, no way, no way mm -hmm. am I going to be the only one in the room no way I'm going to be the only one at my level in the org chart. I'm never doing that again. Mm -hmm. I felt that way. You know, yeah. it's like I'm not working at a company again where I'm the only person that, you know, is, is thinking about these things. And so, um, you know, the vast majority of the time when you tell people, like, we will help you if you want to pursue your career, and whether that's here or elsewhere, the majority of the time it builds the connection yeah. because there's trust there and they know they can, you know, talk about that stuff. Yeah, a lot of what we're talking about really is repeating a lot of the things we've heard this morning and throughout the theme, which is trust, transparency, um, people are wised up because they have a lot more resources to be able to dig in and hear and learn about the company culture inside. We've heard a lot about diversity and inclusion. And Yvonne, the writers that you do research, I mean, that is y'all's focus. Yeah. Talk about that and maybe also give it to us from the product perspective. Yeah. It's not just about employees feeling great. That's very important. It's also about getting a great product. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think for so long the diversity and inclusion question has really suffered from poor framing, right? We think about it, and I mean, I, I don't fault anyone for this, but it, it's often thought of as an add-on, as a nice to have, and as something that's relatively easy to do if we just try hard enough in a low lift. When in fact, and I say this as a former lawyer and a person who used to work on the international labor rights space, it's one of the most difficult questions of our time, right? If we think about what a really inclusive labor market looks like, we've never really done it before. Jobs have always been segmented and separated on the basis of our identity. So when we say we want diversity, equity, and inclusion in our organizations, we're actually saying that we want to do something that's very radical and very new. And I think to the product point, uh, you know, when people do try to make that investment, it's quite often they're thinking about the employee life cycle, which is great and which is really true, but they don't think of it as a product question or they don't connect the employee experience to what their products do, which, I mean, it's common sense, right? Your employees are the people who build your products and the decisions <laughs> they make inform the products they build. And I think now we're seeing in the marketplace, the tech marketplace, some failures that are happening because of cultures that weren't diverse, inclusive, and they were focusing on the wrong thing, right? And there was a failure of ethical decision-making in those organizations, in part because there weren't enough different voices at the table or the voices who were at the table that dissented mm -hmm. fell silent. Yeah. yeah we right. talk about this from a planning standpoint. It's risk reduction, mm -hmm. right? It's very simple. And it's like, I don't, I don't make a business case fundamentally for inclusion because it's a moral thing, right? Like you don't make moral decisions because you want to get rich mm. off them, right? But there is a business case for how you implement it and why. And I, you know, I think one of, and people talk about, oh, it's the right thing to do and it makes your products better. And like, that's all true, but those have become platitudes. I look a lot at risk reduction and how many organizations have paid how many tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in settlements to employees and workers that they wronged. Right? So these people suffered egregious harm. The company suffered reputational harm and mm -hmm. you know, economic cost. Mm -hmm. And all of it was preventable if you just had the right people in the room. And the more talented, more qualified people in the room who were less likely to be predatory and threats to their coworkers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? And it's not just the employees, it's the users as well. Yes. Right? Because That's we're right. seeing That's right. platforms right now that are actively harming their users. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the people who raise these alarms around these harms very early on were silenced, right? Yeah. And then that was built into to the platform as a feature. I mean, clearly I'm talking about Twitter right now, right? <laughs> so like, <laughs> no, but, but there's lots of platforms. There's there's lots of platforms, platforms. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right, right, and, and yeah, go ahead. No, no, please finish, finish your thought. No, and so I think right now we're sort of at this point where we're, we've seen these products affect our democracy, affect our social discourse, affect the distribution of wealth in this country, affect our elections. And so it's, it's really, I think we're at, you know, affect our environment. We're at a point now where we have to make a decision on the kind of organizations we want to continue to build and invest in and the impacts that they, we're going to tolerate them having downstream. And so, I mean, that to me, mm -hmm. that's the product connection, right? Which yeah. is like, and we have success yep. stories. You know, we build a platform where people can build apps and there are millions of apps, millions of people have created them. And there are no large scale harassment mobs. Mm -hmm. There are no organized, you know, targeting of people. There is no mass inf misinformation being spread. And that's with like, you don't even have to log in to create an app. You can be totally anonymous, but if you design a system, you can prevent these harms. Mm -hmm. It is 100% doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you talk about risk reduction. It's reputation, mm -hmm. and that really does overarch uh, a lot of the employee experience. Um, and it's not about, and clearly companies are afraid of this, It's but if we're seeing companies photoshopping minorities and women into <laughs> pictures yeah. that go viral, clearly they, they want to do something. I see that as a sign of them wanting to do something, but sort of grasping at straws. It really, really runs much yeah. deeper than that. Yeah. Let's go to another polling question. Um, and we, we'll take a question from the audience. So have a polling, I have a poll up, and it talks about reputation and brand. So get ready for live polling. What is the most thing, important thing to you about your company's brand? So have a reflection. I'm going to have our panelists reflect back. No one's thinking about their company brand. <laughs> They're thinking hard. They're thinking yeah. hard. Very yeah. good. Yes, yes. So being authentic, leveraging the right technology, such as social media, to brand externally. HR partnering with critical brand functions and other functions. 
consistency of messaging and empowering employees. Catherine, what do you make of this? Well, first of all, I think that many of these things are, I would say, different, different words for the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. If you are genuinely empowering your employees to talk about their lived experiences at your companies, that's a very authentic thing to do. And it's, it's an incredible way, I think, to, um, to relinquish some of the control. But again, also, we see companies that are using their employees as the, the face of their recruiting efforts, for example, are having much more success than trying to centralize and trying to control that. Because frankly, the cat is already out of the bag on that one, mm. right? We can all Google any company right now and read all sorts of things about them whether it's an employee's social media accounts, online review sites. Um, and I think that for, for smart companies, they're saying, what can I learn from what my employees are putting out there? How can I use it to improve? But also, um, how can I lean into the things that may not be everybody's cup of tea, but that are true and unique about our organization? Um, and I think there is a, you know, there is then um, an opportunity once you have that message, sure, you can be consistent about it. But I also think some of the most effective messaging right now is, is um, also personalized to the people that you're speaking with. You know, new, for again, in my world, new grads are looking for different messages and they want to understand different things than more experienced hires. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity there as well. Yeah, that's great. We, we heard of CEOs as chief purpose officers. Um, so I don't know if any of you are thinking of yourselves as that. Um, we, can, we have time for a question. Does anyone have a question that they want to pose to our panel? Yeah. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right, let's <laughs> give you a mic. Let's do that. <laughs> I forget to tell us who you are. Okay. Andrew Field with PFL. I'm guessing I'm the only person here who lives in Montana. Uh, so I'm hoping I'm providing a little bit of rural diversity and inclusion here. Anil, yes. you said something that was extremely provocative. You said these platforms could be built in such a way that mm -hmm. they don't have the nasty toxicity that we see, I think, particularly uh, uh, the, the intolerance on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Please tell us why they don't. And if you and if you don't want to get inside somebody else's head and sure. and, and read their mind, at least tell us how it could be done. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, appreciate the question. I think you all are both as expert on this as anybody. But I, I think um, a couple of things I'd say. You know, I do, I do know some of these folks from when they started building these tools. I've been in this industry a long time, building social platforms. And I, I will say the most charitable interpretation I can offer is that nobody could have reasonably expected hundreds of millions of people to show up on some tool that they built, you know, on the side while they were doing some other project. So there are things that you don't expect about, you know, who's going to come in the door and, and how they're going to act, and that the bad behaviors would amplify and magnify when so many people came in. So that, you know, I, I will grant that. That being said, the harms were predicted, identified, especially by people that were vulnerable to them more than a decade ago, years and years ago. And so when that alarm started being raised, the, you know, the, the response should have been, let me sit down, let me hear you, let me hire you. And let me have you come in and, 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 and evolve these tools. But in terms of like how do you prevent these harms, there are a lot of design things that I, I learn a lot from the built environment, from urban planning, from civic spaces, uh, from public spaces about what we do. And you know, somebody walked into this room and started shouting slurs at somebody here, we wouldn't be like, well, let's have a debate about it. You'd be like, you're not welcome here. We have standards for how you act, right? And, and I think it's as simple as that is to look around at what they do in their physical space. If you walk into YouTube's offices, and you know, start shouting things at people, start saying things about people, start threatening people, they're gonna escort you out at the very least, right? And to say, why should the people on your platform be any less deserving of that same level of dignity and care, uh, I, I think is the starting point. And then there's a lot of things about what do you incentivize mm -hmm. and what do you reward and how do you make money and what are the things that drive engagement and money and, and are those things linked? Uh, you know, we very intentionally, with our platform, have built something that is not ad-driven for um, how people promote them, their works. And there's no, uh, all the algorithms we use to promote content are transparent and visible and open source and people can see them. And those are very intentional choices around people saying, like, why was my thing featured? And there's not some magic black box around why content gets amplified. That does a lot to change the, the, the sort of the trust relationship. You can build large-scale networks that way. It does happen all the time. A lot of that knowledge has sort of been shoved under the rug as these the main platforms have gotten bigger, but there's been for 20 years independent communities online, independent platforms online where people have had constructive, you know, collaboration. Yeah. And I would just add one thing. I think you um, answered that question beautifully, but there may come a point in your 
platform or whatever you build where you have to make a decision, yeah. right? Because, yes, you can try to build it in from the outset, but we don't always know what's going to happen, what, what what's going to happen with the things we build. And you have to make a decision, right? And the decision may be, is it worth this money? Is it worth this mm. line of business? Is it worth this profit? Is it worth engagement for these users? If I'm doing something that undermines my values, undermines the experience for another set of users, goes against our internal policy, what do we do when we come to that decision? How do we how do we talk about it? And when do we just decide if we're going to make a trade off or not? And then how do we implement those decision making systems consistently? Yeah. And do your people in the room know the risk? Yeah. That's again another of these advantages of having a diverse team is they know what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wrap up not with the question that Wyvon, I know you don't like, which is what's one thing that I can do <laughs> better? <laughs> but we're going to do a little spin on it, and it is everyone in this room is a CEO, the CEO that's going to win and get ahead in the future, what is the thing that they need to be thinking about? Catherine, we'll start with you. Um, how to make sure that what you're promising externally is, is yeah. who you are aligns with what people receive when they get in the door. Because there's a lot of ink spilled about how recruiting is becoming marketing. But unlike selling mm -hmm. a sweater, those people that buy your job, they show up every single day. And do you, you better deliver on the promise. That's a great metaphor. Authenticity, great. Um, oh God, I'm going to sound like a real lawyer here, but I think accountability. What does accountability look like in your organization? You can have all these programs, these policies, these ideas, but if people aren't held accountable for when they're promoting them or when they're going against them, they're not going to work, right? And, and the culture you develop may not be the culture you want to have. So I would say, how are you thinking about accountability in your organization? Right, thank you. Um, I think self-reflection, and I think it's probably an aspect of accountability, which is if you haven't confronted what you are doing wrong and what were the flaws and the biases on the way to you getting to be a CEO, um, you're not going to be able to fix what's coming. And, and I think about this a lot. Like my first year in trying to get this right at the company that I'm at was sort of you know eating a lot of crow about what I didn't know and doing a lot of learning, a lot of listening about, you know, um, even like, again, I knew the right things to say, but the gap between like knowing the right things to say and actually doing the work is huge. Um, and if you're not being sort of regularly humbled by the most vulnerable people in your organization about what you've gotten wrong, then you are not listening. Humility and self-reflection. Thank you, Anil, Wyvon, Catherine, thank you so much.